Okay, so in this video, oops, we're going to look at linked genes and recombination frequency. This is part of a like non Mendelian genetics unit. Okay, so before we can say, like, understand why it's called non Mendelian genetics, let's revisit Mendel and his two laws. So Mendel, when studying pea plants, studied traits that were located on separate chromosomes. Um, what we are going to see today is what happens when traits are inherited on the same chromosome. When traits are inherited on the same chromosome, we call those genes as linked. Uh, so linked genes or linked traits. But here in my example, trait A and trait B or gene A and B are not linked. They're located on separate chromosomes. And because these are sister chromatids that have been duplicated, I'm just going to add the second um, copies there. So now during meiosis, uh, when the um, alleles separate, that is Mendel's first law of segregation, uh, and then they end up into gametes, and each, each gamete is haploid. Now, in Mendel's law of independent assortment, that is stating how uh, these two traits do not influence each other's inheritance, meaning that they're not linked. Like you could have a dominant A end up in a gamete with a dominant B, or you could have a dominant A end up in a gamete with a recessive B. They do not influence each other's um, inheritance patterns. And that's really because of metaphase one, when the pairs move to the center of the cell, there's different possibilities of which um, like maternal or paternal chromosomes will be on which side. So as we go through meiosis though, we see there's a whole nother possibility that's equally likely to happen of haploid gametes. So these two pictures here are basically showing us Mendel's law of independent assortment and the variation that is possible in our offspring. Now, if a person was, or an individual was homozygous recessive for both of these traits, all of their gametes would only have recessive alleles, right? No matter how you align them along the middle, uh, it's all going to be the same. So let's go ahead and uh, see how or why when we um, go to set up, oops, I'm trying to use the pen. When we go to set up a dihybrid cross, like the, these here are those four, um, oops, those four like genetic combinations that we write at the top of that, um, okay, at the top of that 16 box dihybrid uh, Punnett square. So that's kind of where those four options come from is because of independent assortment um, creating haploid gametes. So if these two traits truly were on separate chromosomes and inherit and were inherited independently of each other, uh, not linked. When these, this cross happened, a dihybrid cross with the homozygous recessive, what we would see is that all four of these possibilities in offspring would be equally likely. So if you had a large number of offspring, if it was like plants or flies or something that has a lot of babies, uh, you could be able to count the offspring's phenotypes and you should come across a one to one to one to one ratio. So um, if you cross a dihybrid, uh, like a test cross or something with a homozygous recessive, and these genes truly are located on different chromosomes, and you can expect a one-to-one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one -to -one ratio in their phenotypes. Okay, but what would we expect or what would happen if genes were linked? What happens if A and B were not on separate chromosomes? What happens if they were inherited together? Okay, let's see. So if we still have a heterozygote who's dominant for both traits, but now we notice that gene A and gene B are on the same chromosome, not separate ones. So now they are going to go together when um, meiosis creates these haploid gametes. Okay, okay. Now, if an individual, though, was uh, homozygous recessive, we would still have all of their gametes would still have a lower case, like a recessive A and B uh, in all of them. We're, let's go back to that uh, heterozygote on the left. And you notice that if they are linked, like the two dominant can go together and the two recessive can go together. So if this is what happened in these offspring, and um, I don't know, okay, um, basically we look at, well, what possibility of offspring can happen? So here, if you take a, an egg uh, that is dominant, carrying the d two dominant alleles, and it's fertilized by a sperm that is carrying both recessive, well, now you would have a child or an offspring that is going to be, um, oops, sorry, that is going to be dominant for both traits, right? Uh, versus if you take the other option of the gametes from the parent on the left and you fertilize it, this parent, I'm sorry, 
this offspring, uh, will look like the homozygous recessive parent. It's going to have a recessive phenotype for both traits. So um, this child on the left or this offspring on the left will have the dominant phenotype for both, and the one on the right will have the recessive phenotype for both. Now, these offspring do look like, like either parent, so we actually will call these offspring parental offspring, and we'll see why that matters in a few minutes. Um, so with this being linked, you would kind of only expect two possible phenotypes to show up in the offspring uh, because you don't have that independent assortment creating four different combinations. So now how were linked genes ever discovered, right? Like how does someone even figure this out? Well, back in the early 1900s, there was a scientist named T.H. Morgan, and he had a few other like uh, co-workers, co-scientists, um, and they were working in New York, um, and I think New York, maybe Boston, I don't know. Uh, anyway, they were studying fruit flies, and they bred lots of flies, generation after generation, and um, it was his work with these flies where he was the person who figured out, oh my gosh, genes are inherited on chromosomes. Before his work with flies, we didn't know exactly what was passing our traits from parents to offspring. So his work with flies is what told us, oh, our traits are inherited on chromosomes. So one of the crosses that he did is he took a homozygous dominant uh, fruit fly with a gray body and normal wings. So homos our parental generation, homozygous dominant for both traits. Gray body and normal wings are our dominant phenotypes. Then uh, it was crossed with a homozygous recessive um, partner and it has a black body and vestigial wings. So those like shriveled wings. So with vestigial wings, you wouldn't really fly as a fly below fitness. So they crossed them and think to yourself, the F1 will look like what? Well, they should all look like the dominant phenotypes, gray body and normal wings, because they're going to have a dominant allele for each. All of the F1 will be heterozygotes, a dye hybrid. So then what he did is he test crossed the F1. So he basically crossed the F1 with homozygous recessive males. So he took gray females with normal wings from the F1 generation and crossed them with homozygous recessive males. Okay, so if uh, these two traits were inherited on separate chromosomes and followed Mendel's laws of independent assortment, okay, there are our parents to remind you, um, here are the possible gametes in that female if these truly were inherited as separate on separate chromosomes. And then in the male, uh, really all of his gametes are going to have the recessive alleles for both. So um, as we fill in this Punnett square, we see that uh, there are four possible phenotypes in the offspring, um, and they should all show up equally likely in a one-to-one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one -to -one ratio, a 25% chance of each of them. So uh, when we think, though, if we compare these offspring to the parents, what we see is 50% of the offspring the gray with normal wings on the left and the black with shriveled wings or vestigial wings on the right, those are our parental uh, phenotypes and look like the parents where the other two in the middle um, are different. So uh, let's go ahead and see here. So if he, I think this is real data too. If he had 2,300 flies, 2,300 offspring in the F2, how many of each phenotype would you expect? Now this is very similar to if you have done chi-squared questions in genetics. So here you're like, okay, my expected would be um, the total 2,300 times 25%. I would expect them all to show up a one to one to one to one ratio. So we would times that and we would expect 575 flies uh, for each of these phenotypes. But his actual data turned out like this. What the heck, yo? Look at those numbers. Hmm, what the heck happened? And this is where you would do a chi-squared and you would reject the null hypothesis and be like, no, those traits are not on different chromosomes. They are not assorting independently. Something is changing the inheritance. Now, if we really look at it, so T.H. Morgan looked at the offspring and was like, wow, the majority of the offspring look like the parents. You have the majority have either the gray body and normal wings or the black body and vestigial wings. Then you have some that are like a mixture, like they got swapped or something. 
Hmm. So this led him to hypothesize that the traits for body color and wing shape were actually linked and inherited on the same chromosome. So let's go ahead and take a minute and see uh, what does that even look like. So here, if the traits for um, body color and wing shape, here I have Bs are for body color and then Gs are for wing shape, um, but it doesn't really matter as long as you just kind of follow along. So here, if they are linked on the same chromosome, if this is our heterozygote parent, right, our heterozygous parent, the female from the uh, F1 that was heterozygous for both traits, look at her gametes. Half of her gametes would inherit a dominant allele for both and then a recessive allele for both. Okay, okay. This is where we get those uh, parental looking offspring, the ones that had the gray body and normal wings and the black body and vestigial wings. Because if these eggs are fertilized by sperm carrying a little b and a little g, then you would get heterozygotes and homozygous recessive offsprings. But now, where did these two phenotypes come from, right? Ooh, I hope you're thinking about crossing over. So sometimes, or every time you have your um, homologous pairs line up with synapsis, we have that chiasma occur and crossing over. So now these genes are getting switched. So now if we follow, the uh, process of meiosis and that recombinant chromosome. Oh, look at those two middle gametes. Okay, okay. Carrying a different combination on the chromosomes. So this gamete here, uh, if it was fertilized, because this is in the female, the mother that was a dihybrid, she's the one having crossing over happened. If crossing over happened in the homozygous male, it wouldn't matter because it'd be switching a recessive allele for a recessive allele. It, it, it happens, but it doesn't change anything. So here though, uh, when you switch these alleles, now there's a gamete that is coding for normal wings, but a black body, a recessive body. And then you have this gamete that is carrying the genes to have a normal gray phenotype, but vestigial wings. So here, when we look at this, so here we have our parental phenotypes um, that are the products of normal, like uh, non-recombinant chromosomes happening. That's what happens most of the time. And then here you're going to have um, the, the recombinant chromosomes that ended up in the gametes being fertilized. Ooh, okay, okay. So we call these offspring that are the products of crossing over, basically. We actually call them recombinant offspring. So when we look at data here, so if we look at data, we can see that these ones in the middle um, that don't look like either parent and their numbers are in less than uh, what we would expect. Like the parental phenotypes have the greater amount and then these ones have less uh, occurrence. We call these the recombinant offspring. Now I wanna compare some data though real fast. So let's go ahead and compare it to this table with these recombinant offspring. Now the one on the right is fake data I just made up to make a point. Okay, so now if we compare the amounts of recombinant offspring, that also gives us some new information. We can use that information to figure out how closely together these two genes are on the same chromosomes. If the numbers are large, that tells us they're far apart and crossing over happens a lot. If the numbers are small, that tells us, oh, crossing over does not happen very often. These two genes must be very close together and they hardly ever get separated by crossing over. Okay, so now uh, we can calculate this. We can calculate how often crossing over happens. This is called recombination frequencies. So to calculate recombination frequencies, you take the number of recombinant offspring divided by the total times 100. So here with our first example, we would take our 206 plus our 185 divided by the total offspring, because we're curious how often um, does crossing over happen to make those recombinant chromosomes that we can see in the phenotypes of the F2. So in this first example, it happens 17% of the time of meiosis, right, of making gametes. Now, uh, in 
The second data set, if you do the same thing, 34 plus 37 divided by 2300 times 100, we get only 3%. Ooh, that would tell us they are located very close together on the same chromosome. Now, why would this be important? Well, T.H. Morgan, the fruit fly guy, he actually used this information in a process called gene mapping. If um, the percentage is high, that tells us that the genes are located far apart on the chromosome and um, crossing open, crossing open, crossing over happens frequently between them to separate them. Whereas if you have small numbers, that tells you they're closer together. So you can use recombination frequencies to find the genetic loci on a chromosome of different traits or different traits on the same chromosome. Now, gene mapping using these recombination frequencies is a whole nother topic in biology. And I'll have to make a separate video to show you how uh, to uh, do gene mapping based on uh, these percentages. Okay, okay, good job.